I also, I'm about to turn us over and get us unleashed on the first talk, but first I wanted to briefly introduce uh, Camille Crittenden. She has done so much work to help us track down some great speakers. Uh, she is very well to known to, the, to our meetup family here. Uh, Camille's the executive director at Citrus, the um, Center for Information Technology in the Interests of Society. And she's also the executive director, I guess, as part of that of the Banato Institute and is the co-founder of Citrus Policy Lab and the Women in Tech Initiative at UC. Um, she ch also, she's involved in so many different things. She's a co-PI on the PR Pacific Research Platform, and she is also a chair of the California Blockchain Working Group. So I wanted to turn it over to Camille, who will not butcher the introduction for our featured guest tonight. Uh, so Camille, handing it over to you. Great. Thank you, Bill. And I'm really delighted to be with you all again and to help participate in um, suggesting speakers and collaborating with the folks who lead this great series. Um, and I'm especially delighted to welcome uh, Carlos and Stephanie from UC Santa Cruz. As you know, Citrus is a multi-campus research institute and Santa Cruz, along with Davis, Merced, and Berkeley, uh, is one of the campuses represented in that consortium. So we're excited to strengthen that partnership. Also, the Pacific Research Platform, many of you probably heard from Larry Smarr at a previous meeting um, what that's all about, uh, and it meshes very nicely with what Carlos and Stephanie will be talking about tonight, and that is Ceph. Um, it's a platform that many of you had expressed interest in, actually, on a previous poll uh, at a previous meeting, so we're glad that we can present Carlos and Stephanie. Um, so Carlos Maltzon is the founder and director of the UC Santa Cruz Center for Research in Open Source Software, or CROSS, and Stephanie Leiji is the assistant director there, and um, they'll be making the presentation today. Uh, both of them have great experience. Um, Carlos especially was there from the very beginning of the development and creation of Ceph, uh, and so we'll be eager to hear what he has to say about its evolution and then how it's currently being implemented. So I'll turn it over to Carlos and Stephanie. Thanks. Thank you, Camille, um, and uh, thank you so much for having me here, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to um, uh, to tell you about uh, how and what. Um, so let me uh, quickly get to the sharing part here, and oh, that's the wrong, nope, that's not what I wanted to share. Um, let me just stop sharing. I don't know. There's a sometimes my. Let me just put this on here again. I want this window. Come on. Okay. There we go. I hope this works. Um, hmm. All right. Uh, can anybody see my screen? Can you hear, can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, now I can. Oh, there you go. Okay. Now it's good. Sorry, it's just a little slow. Um, so, um, so I'm going to talk about the Ceph project. This is actually going to be very quick, uh, 15 minutes, uh, um, two parts. First, I'm going to talk about uh, the evolution of Ceph and what that resulted in. And then Stephanie is going to talk about CROSS. So a quick introduction. Uh, I'm an adjunct professor. Uh, uh, my uh, field is computer science and engineering. Okay. I'm also the founder and director of the Center for Research and Open Source Software. Um, and uh, before I joined UC Santa Cruz in 2005, I was a performance engineer at NetApp. I'm currently advising five PhD students and graduated nine PhD students and nine master's uh, students. And you can find out more about uh, at that URL, people.ucsc.edu at Um So my field of research is programmable storage systems. Um, I was a key mentor uh, of Sage Weil when we were developing the Ceph uh, uh, storage system. And uh, I was sort of there from the beginning. Um, I was also the one who actually um, came up with a name. So, uh, Stephanie, a quick introduction. I don't know, Stephanie, you want to briefly jump in and introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm uh, Stephanie Ligi. I'm the assistant director 
at Cross. Um, I've been there since 2016. My field is actually in, um, my, previous to that, I was actually uh, working uh, in political science and social sciences. Um, I had uh, been a, a research associate and an adjunct professor at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey for um, basically for um, 15, 16 years. And uh, my main focus was actually nonproliferation, so something really different. But I had actually worked a lot on uh, building up uh, uh, research programs while I was there and um, kind of running in the operations of, of research programs. So it was a natural fit. And open source was really actually something I was particularly interested in because of how powerful I saw it being in just, you know, even in, even within the social sciences and the use of certain open source programs there. So my background is definitely not computer science, but um, as I always say, I'm the social science and scientist in the room every time we have research meetings, but um, I definitely uh, enjoyed uh, the change since. Uh, since Very useful, <laughs> <laughs> especially for open source software projects. Um, um, so why? It's the first question uh, you asked me to answer. Um, in early 2000s, the DOE National Labs had a file system scalability problem. Uh, just to, I don't know how many people are familiar with uh, supercomputers, but they basically have like 10,000s of uh, you know, computers that are just computing things. And they're very tightly coupled. The algorithms are highly parallel. Uh, and if something goes wrong, like one of those computers fails, um, there's no way to sort of recover on the fly. You have to basically start from the beginning, unless you uh, uh, committed some checkpoint, and then you can start from a checkpoint. Uh, for checkpoints, you need to have very fast uh, storage systems because the amount of data that has to be actually committed to uh, disks is very large. Um, and so in the early 2000s, it got to the point where the file systems didn't scale anymore. And so it, it took actually longer to open the thousands of files than to actually write to them. Um, so clearly something was wrong with file systems. And so we got some funding uh, to solve that uh, from uh, Los Alamos and DIA National Labs and Lawrence Livermore. And that was all part of a, a project uh, done by the National Nuclear Security Agency. Um, administration. Um, I have to be careful. I think that's nuclear yeah. safety. Safety because the other one is the Chinese uh, organization. <laughs> that's so, yeah. administration. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so quickly, so, you know, so, but I just wanted to emphasize the roots of Ceph are supercomputing. It is a file system design. Um, that was uh, designed to solve a scalability problem in supercomputing. And uh, we started it in 2005 as a summer project that was just to be there for like a journal paper that we we're going to publish. And then while we're like actually building a functional system, we found so many interesting gaps that it turned into the PhD thesis of Safe File. And he uh, published in 2006, both an OSDI paper and a supercomputing paper, both top-notch conferences. And these, you know, the OSDI paper in particular is, is, is a very highly cited paper today. And 2007, Sage defended, and there's the original logo of Ceph. Um, and I'm, I'm just gonna give you a very quick overview of how Ceph works. So the idea of Ceph is, to decouple data and metadata. So here you see a traditional file system. You see basically there's applications, there's the file system, and there's the storage component. This is sort of like how it would look like on your laptop. Um, but what actually, um, what Ceph does, it basically uh, decouples the metadata management and the storage component. And remember, you know, the problem was that it took longer to open files than to actually write to them. And so this was a, a way to uh, then scale out independently the metadata service and the, the actual data uh, storage service. Um, and so the way this works is basically you have, uh, you open up a file uh, that would, the client would actually uh, contact uh, the metadata service. Uh, 
then the metadata server would grab the data from the object store. Uh, in this case, the metadata server is really a distributed cache, not much more actually. And then you, you would get the file handle back to the client, it would read, it calculates based on the names, the locations of where the data is, and then grabs the objects from the many storage uh, servers um, that are there, and then it closes it, right? And so the key thing here is that the client has just enough information, which is very small, to calculate essentially the location of each object. And, um, and so this is, this is what makes Ceph actually scalable today. Um, so that's all I wanted to say about Ceph. Uh, what's really remarkable of Sage's career is that he actually kept working on Ceph after he graduated. And so one of the things, and this is where cloud computing comes into play, was that when he actually continued working on Ceph is that there, was much more opportunity to actually do work for a community called OpenStack, which was sort of around 2008, 2009, really exploding. I mean, they were like on a on an exponential trajectory. The meetings were exponentially larger every year, and so um, and so then uh, that led to a startup called Ink Tank uh, and a new logo. <laughs> And, um, and then finally, Ink Tank got uh, sold to Red Hat for 175 million. So if you look at this timeline, uh, it's 10 years, 175 million for open source software. So that's pretty good. Um, and today, uh, you know, Ceph is uh, widely used. There are many companies that consider Ceph as a strategic component. Um, it's growing. Uh, these are just some of the companies that are really investing in it. So what happened then is that, uh, uh, you know, I learned that when somebody, uh, alumnus made a lot of money, uh, you approach the alumnus and ask shamelessly for money. <laughs> and this is uh, what I did. And Sage said, yeah, I'm gonna fund, uh, give you $2 million or so two and a half million dollars as it turns out, if you uh, create a structure that will allow other students to have a similar career as I had, as he had, right? And so the, the result is the Center for Research in Open Source Software. It took me about a year to, to create it and to get the first three members. The first three members were Kyosha, SK Hynix, and Micron. And right now the four uh, 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 companies that fund CROSS are Kyosha, Fujitsu, Seagate, and Samsung. So with that, oh yeah, and I should say, what basically cross uh, uh, is, 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 is solving is this gap, right? There's this gap uh, between 2008 and 2011. So at, at, at 2008, where students usually go on and have a job and they just have to sort of abandon their research prototypes, right? And so cross is basically doing this. So Stefan. Great, thanks Carlos. Um, so right, so uh, the what the this, um, when we looked looked at what happened with Ceph, it was really obvious that this was something that would be great to be replicated for other um, students in with similarly innovative projects. And so, as as Carlos mentioned, you know the process and the history of how Cross came came to be. One of the main focuses of Cross, really the main goal, is to kind of bridge that gap that he was talking about just then uh, between what the student research is from, from student research um, to open source software projects. And the, um, and that was, a, that was, a, that's always, a, as Carlos was mentioning, really a big part of um, where we often see really innovative research not going any further because, you know, students graduate and then they don't continue with the project. So uh, Sage's f uh, funding along with our corporate members that Carlos already mentioned has really helped us move forward with um, supporting uh, students to replicate what, what Sage was able to do with Seth. Um, and we have three pillars that we focus on in particular, um, the education pillar, the research pillar, and the incubator. Now the education in particular helps us teach students how to actively and productively engage in open source communities. And that's great because it's not just creating um, skill, skill sets for the students, which is really important and helpful for them to 
have a, an existing portfolio when they graduate um, as undergrads and helpful when they're moving on into the workforce. But it's also creating, as we've discovered, and I'll talk about in a little more detail, that it creates this great uh, pool of developers who can become uh, parts of our community, parts of our open source communities. Um, another part of that is uh, we fund uh, research. So the research is done by PhD students, the way that, like, similar to the way that Sage was doing his work on Ceph while he was still a PhD student. So it's very similar to that Ceph model. And, um, and then we incubate the projects. And then after graduation, we'll have a postdoc um, or you know, recent graduates who will then develop their original projects um, into incubators to the, and they develop the communities around our research prototypes. And those are often are, are th th that's often that, that period that was really hard for your average PhD student who just graduated um, to, to, to make that jump from the, um, from the research part to the actual incubator. Okay. Um, this is just a quick snapshot of what we look like um, um, with regards to the, the structure across uh, the governance is um, the day to day operations is Carlos and I and our colleague Livinia Preston. Um, Carlos mentioned our industry members that make up our industry advisory board, and they're not just our kind of financial backing, they're also really important and critical in our understanding of where industry is going on certain er in certain areas, and uh, the feedback we get from them is like crucial to the success of our projects. Um, also, something we're particularly proud of is our advisory committee. Um, and that's made up of individuals who are really well known uh, in, in open source. Sorry. And uh, that includes uh, uh, Doug Cutting, in particular, a you know, well known uh, uh, expert in um, open source and the creator of uh, really important uh, projects like, uh, like Hadoop. Then um, there's Karen Sandler, who's also really. Uh, a significant uh, open source expert, particularly in the legal side, licensing and compliance. And she's also got a great insight on community and community building. So she's been a great help really from the start with, um, with Cross. We also have Nisa Stratman, who is great, uh, also on the legal side, but more from the corporate level. So we have a, but we got to, can see it from both angles because uh, she's been working in industry uh, for, for many years on open source issues. And of course we have Sage himself, uh, giving us uh, input and, adv and advising us and very heavily involved still in our in the workings of CROSS. And then from the academic side, uh, James Davis was a professor in the computer science and engineering program at UCSC and also very much into um, understanding and pr um, promoting entrepreneurship within academia and also has a lot of um, uh, experience with startups. So he's been a really great uh, addition to our advisory committee. Uh, uh, next slide. Um, just really quickly, because uh, I know we don't have a ton of time. We could go over, we could talk forever about our, our incubator projects. We could go into a lot of detail about them. So if you have any particular questions, let us know, um, either at the Q&A or, or later. But what our incubators are doing are really are trying to follow that model like we were talking about with Ceph, um, where it's a po you know, pre uh, or post graduation um, creating a, a research prototype. So all of these projects are actually quite different from each other in topic areas. But when the one thing they have in common are their postdocs building development uh, developer communities for their, their research prototypes. And they've all are graduated with their PhDs not that long ago. Um, they, oh, sorry. They start out with significant code base, and um, the, and what's also important is they're leveraging at least one open source community. So they have an established open source community that they're working with. Um, the the because we don't have a, a lot of time, um, I, I'll probably not go into too much detail. Just to point out that the if we're looking at Ceph as something particular, the our first project by uh, Jeff Lefevre that's run by Jeff Lefevre Skyhook uh, was probably one that's closest to Ceph because it's uh, working uh, particularly to leverage programmable programmable storage uh, capabilities to enhance data management directly within a storage layer in Ceph. So. Um, 
so that so there is like a follow-on to some of this the stuff work um, that kind of started cross but also uh you know other projects that are in, in different fields as well so we could talk about a little bit maybe more if we have time during the q a about those um about those incubators but what we found which was really in, in, interesting um really after a year or two of uh, of working with incubators and the research projects is that we had that we were seeing this uh this um something we didn't expect which is this ability to use the fact that we were a in an academic an open source kind of program inside an academic institution to be able to help seed our programs because we had this great pool of students who needed project topics who needed experience to show a portfolio of work that um that they they could show that they could do when they when they graduated um and so we had this uh this great opportunity to include uh to help our own projects by creating um creating a, a community uh uh to seed their communities um which helped our helped our um, our uh our incubator fellows to really learn how to manage their communities which is really important for open source for open source projects and was really a great driver for uh, building the community infrastructure. Um, and the next, and so what we were able to do, and uh, Carlos, next slide. Um, what we were able to do with that was to create a program uh, that we just launched today, actually, officially, called uh, the Research Experience Program. And it's targeting um, undergraduates um, uh, to give them uh, a additional chance to work with uh, under a mentorship program with our fellows both our incubator and research fellows to um, and then also try and garner um, support from outside funders particularly from industry and the idea is to match funders who are interested in specific projects uh, specific work by specific fellows within CROSS uh, who have posted um, re project research ideas um, that students then use as basis for their summer uh, proposals for summer work. So there's a summer, uh, basically a summer internship, internship program with very direct mentorship from our research fellows. And we just launched it today. Um, and I don't want to, I, I can go into more detail about that maybe if you guys have questions in the Q&A, but we have a website which I can add to the chat in a sec in a bit um, that gives you all the details on that. But it was a really exciting um, um, uh, kind of exciting program that we're just getting started and really again it was something that was born out of us seeing the, re the positive results we were getting for from um, the undergraduates working with our incubator our incubator fellows right and next last slide thank you I don't want to um, forget and I know we don't have a lot of time to go into too much detail but we do of course have our research uh, projects as well. And these are PhD students who, similar to the way uh, Sage was developing Seth in his PhD, um, in his, you know, during his PhD program, these five uh, fellows are doing the same. They all have, uh, are addressing a fundamental research question. They are um, creating uh, cutting edge research projects, and they all have a plausible uh, path to successful open source software projects, but the mainly focus. This is these projects are still research projects. Um, they're not actually required to write any code, um, but uh, you know these are meant to be follow these students through and is uh, the basis of their dissertation. Um, and if you're interested in any of these particular projects um, or anything that Cross does, we actually have a symposium coming up in October. Typically, this is a two day symposium. Uh, but this year, with two-day symposium, with two tracks. But this year, we're moving it online, like everything, and it'll be a four-day uh, event um, that's a single track. And they, the the workshops for these symposiums center around um, our all of our research projects. So each of our research projects will be highlighted um, within these uh, these workshops. Um, but they're not just the students that are working on them. There may be other students working parallel with our students on similar projects or industry experts or other academics working on very similar topics. And so with other workshops actually become a really great um, draw for people who are generally working on the topics that are related to 
uh, what all of our fellows are working on. And it's a great way for us to really show off uh, the work of both our research program and, and this uh, in general and this uh, specific work our students are doing. And they also get a chance to, the undergraduates also get a chance to show off their work to not just our graduate students and, and postdocs. All right, and I think the last slide, I think. Great, and I think uh, Carlos, you might wanna chime in on, on this one as well, but really looking at what, uh, what really has worked with CROSS um, is the way that, you know, it, how industry has become engaged with working on these uh, research prototypes via open source. Um, and that's definitely been a, a success that we've seen in CROSS. How these incubator projects have really helped um, move our research, uh, incubator projects have helped move PhD students' work into um, an actual, um, you, know, you know, being supported by uh, developer communities. Um, and the research experience has, to, uh, to me at least, has been something that, again, we wasn't really in our additional mandate of what we were going to do, but really uh, has, you know, become an important part of the work we were doing. Um, and I think, you know, it's increasingly important um, as, as we move forward. Um, also, we didn't talk, uh, we didn't really have a chance to talk about um, the practitioner and residence program, which has been great and gives us a lot of um, assistance and insight um, into um, into industry's views and industry's uh, outlook, and uh, that basically is that someone uh, you know an industry uh, expert who is maybe between companies or is taking wants to do a little bit more you know, research or something takes some time off and works with us um, at UCSE, and it's been it's been great. The the ones we've had have been really helpful, and then the call for proposals have been uh, really helpful because it gives us a chance for, um, uh, for industry to um, kind of tell us what, what is coming down the pipe, what are the important topics. And then our, our researchers and, and faculty kind of kind of look at that and get and garner from that what, you know, how the research they are working on actually might be uh, um, able to move forward within, within industry and we were able to focus on matching funders with actually uh, researchers who um, are working on things they're most interested in. So that is it. And Carlos, you might want to add to that wrap up. Oh. Uh, yeah, thank you, Stephanie. And uh, I know we are really out of time, but one of the things that we also discovered as part of the industry practitioner and residence program is that we actually had uh, a number of companies together that was uh, actually almost the entire industry and, and storage component makers. And so we actually became a standardization incubator. So we're actually working on things for computational storage devices that are intended to eventually become blueprints for standardization efforts. And so that's a very exciting thing that open source software enables you to do. Um, and it actually is fantastic for uh, PhD students um, to really uh, get the feedback from industry of what are the, the relevant questions and and to, to make the you know in, in in otherwise very difficult kind of research where a lot of the components are proprietary uh, to really navigate you know that field uh, and find the interesting questions and the relevant questions uh, is actually made much easier by having this constant feedback by industry so Thank you, Stephanie. And I think, uh, you know, we just, uh, there's a lot of people who were involved in the founding and creation of, uh, and, 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 and also direction of, of CROSS. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, again, I'd like to also thank our sponsors, Kyosha, Micron, SK Hynix, Seagate, Western Digital, Huawei, Samsung, Fujitsu, uh, of which four of them are currently supporters. And please feel free to contact us. Um, and uh, with that, um, for question, if we still have time. There is a question in chat. Why don't I read it to you? Uh, this is for Stephanie. With respect to the communication skills necessary for successful open source projects, how do you promote the development of good documentation? Tech papers, reference, tutorials, demos, engaging intros, etc. I've seen too many interesting GitHub projects with good code, but abysmal docs. E.g. just read the default readme.md. Yeah. Now that's definitely something we've um, heard. We haven't worked. Uh, I don't think we focused. On, I, I don't think we focus enough attention on it within, particularly within our incubators. But that's something they've definitely started looking at, um, at improving on. 
we had hoped to do um, Google Summer of Docs this year, but it didn't happen. We've done Google Summer of Code. Um, obviously, that's not that's not documentation focused, but um, we had such a good experience with that. We were hoping to do it with Docs and kind of that be a good way to kind of get started and have also train our I don't want to say train our uh, incubator fellows to kind of understand that <laughs> or understand the importance of documentation. Um, but uh, it's definitely something that's on our horizon. I think that each individual incubator fellow deal with it a little bit differently. Um, so I don't think we don't have a standard way of doing it, but it's actually something we have. I have talked about to some extent with some of the fellows about uh, like what's a better way of, um, you know, assuring that the documentation is in order and, and not kind of what you know, what you're just what, what Alex is describing here. So, um, Carlos, did you have maybe a little bit more insight on on that from? Yeah, no, no. It was. I mean, uh, you know, the, the the there are some incubator fellows like Ivo Jimenez who yeah. do a fantastic job in, in documentation, and they're also the ones that are more more most eagerly wanted to actually participate in the Google season of Docs. Um, which is, you know, a fairly new uh, effort, but we unfortunately didn't make it into as a as a mentor organization into that this summer. Hope to hopefully next summer. Um, but the the cool thing is, if you have uh, since we have one incubator fellow who's you know knows how this this actually is now also imitated or replicated by the other incubator fellows. So the incubator fellows actually learn from each other um, how to you know how to really present their projects in a way that 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 uh, invites participation, right? you know, and that's actually one of the biggest, um, the biggest uh, things that, uh, especially PhD students or people who have, you know, spent years uh, doing a PhD have to really learn um, that it's not just about writing papers and doing, you know, new research or answering research questions, but it's actually creating an artifact that's really appealing and invites participation. And that's, a, I think, a very different kind of mindset uh, that they learn. And they have a lot of fun learning it. Yeah, and you, I'm, just to also highlight, uh, Carlos mentioned Ivo uh, Jimenez, who works, who's the head of the, or leads the Popper project. And he, and you talk, brought up tutorials in your question, and he has, like, there's a very well, you know, set up number of tutorials. and. Uh, th those type of um, that type of documentation for for users and new users. So I think I think um, yeah, definitely uh, we have a we have a good model if you look at the Popper project to to kind of point to for for the documentation. But yeah, it's, it's definitely uh, something where we, we take take we should see as important. I want to quickly answer that question that is in the chat. Uh, is there funding combined with successful applications on the incubator? If yes, it is connect. Is it connected to equity? So you see Santa Cruz is a public university. There are private universities who have that. There's, for instance, the runway project at um, uh, um, Cornell. Uh, and so uh, they're actually, uh, they give $100,000 to people who want to actually do, a, you know, spend time founding a startup. And then that $100,000 becomes equity in that company. Um, a public university is not allowed to do that. Uh, we would have to, you know, create a foundation that would be independent of the university. Uh, we have thought about that, but what we are doing right now is mostly just, we, you know, doing our best in creating the environment so that these uh, incubator fellows can uh, come up with their own ways of of of, of finding the the support um, for for actually making a jump into entrepreneurship. Uh, and I can look actually, uh, uh, there are so many different ways and we see actually already in our more mature incubator projects where people come up with the most awesome ideas. Um, again, Ivo Jimenez, for instance, he's actively going through key to key projects and he's actually using his particular framework to make their um, you know, to suggest to them how to make uh, participation in their pro uh, projects more um, frictionless or remove friction to, to, to invite more participation in their projects. And it's been a very successful marketing strategy. Um, and so it's, you know, and then he sort of started out, he has already a number of consulting services. And so I think I'm pretty, 
uh, convinced that in a year from now he has found a way to sort of independently run this project and then we can just declare the success. Um, and that's that's how we are. We don't have a formal way. We can basically, we only say that these incubator projects have a runtime of two to four years, which is essentially what a, a postdoc is, right? And so, um, and, and at some point we'll have to sort of say, okay, you know, you had enough funding <laughs> if it didn't turn out and that's fine, right? Uh, uh, people need a chance, and if they, uh, if it doesn't turn out, that's just part of uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, but uh, if it does turn out, then I think uh, it's a wonderful thing. But we, you know, as uh, we haven't actually had a follow up to the Ceph success, um, so we are still waiting for that second data point of success uh, for Cross. So we are now in our fifth year, and I think people are starting to sort of uh, wait for that to happen, and we know that. Okay, well, thank you so much, Carlos and Stephanie.